Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Thursday, May 9th, 2019 Market Watchers Live Show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinland. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. You picked a great one. And for our regulars, welcome back. All right, uh, let's take a look at what's going on in the market today. We got the Dow Jones Industrial Average down 359 points as the selling escalates. The S&P 500 down 31, the NASDAQ down 92, and the Russell 2000 down 16. So we are see seeing selling across the board. The 10-year Treasury yield trying to hold in at about that 2.45% area, but you can see we did mark a new six-week low today earlier. Got down to about that 2.42, 2.43 area as money continues to rotate into the more defensive bonds. Volatility index continuing to put in new highs. We see another big jump today, up more than 9%, up to 21. Anytime this volatility index moves like this to the upside, we tend to see a lot more impulsive selling in the market. And that is certainly the case today. Overseas, South Korea and China having rough days. You can see leading uh, global markets lower. Uh, the South Korean market, you can see down more than 4% today. China, another 2.7%. And both of these, you can see, have had very, very rough, steep drops over the past couple of weeks. Technology here in the US struggling, the worst performing group. It is getting a 50 day test. We'll talk about that maybe later in the show. Semiconductors, of course, a lot of exposure in, uh, in China. And so this group understandably getting hit very hard this week with the trade war uh, picking up steam again. A couple of uh, stocks in the news going in different directions, both reporting earnings. Roku up $15, moving back above 80. This is an all-time high. The company came out with much better than expected results, getting a big lift here. Trade Desk nearly doubled its bottom line expectations, 49 cents versus 25. But the stock has run up a lot, and it is getting hit pretty hard. 180 has served as pretty good support past couple of months. We'll see if we can continue to hold that. So far, we have. All right, uh, Aaron, almost the end of a week. We got a really special day today. How are you doing? <laughs> I am doing absolutely fabulous. I well, mean I, I do want to mention, because we got a lot going on today, but I do want to just make a, a quick note and mention that, this, that we do have a special here at Stock Charts this week. Uh, it is through Monday. So if you sign up um, as a new member, not only would you get your 30-day free trial, but if by Monday you decide to extend and become an annual member, you'll get an additional two free months. So for anyone out there who wants to try stock charts, now is the time. You can, you can sign up today, get your free month, get two free months by going out a year. So you literally pay for 12 months and get 15. For those of you that are existing members, if you sign up uh, for an additional year, you'll get two additional free months as well. So don't let this special pass you by. It does end on Monday. All right, Aaron, I, I say we just get into it because we have got a great day lined up. So uh, why don't you just take it away? Absolutely. Let's first look at our upcoming schedule coming up. <laughs> it's going to be a great week. Next week, I'll be doing a workshop on Tuesday. Christopher Brecher will be in on Wednesday, and he has told me he will be talking about IPOs. And I know there's been interest in that. Uh, talking technically Thursday, and then Mary Ellen will be in for what's hot and what's not. Today, you are right, is, it is an absolutely special day. We have John Murphy here to do the market message and talk to us about all the exciting things going on in the market today. Technical headlines will follow that. We have the 10 and 10. Atlassian Corp is going to be the first symbol, T-E-A-M. And then we're going to finish off with some stock charts, tips and tricks, and go take the poll. We'll talk about that at the end of the show, about which uh, tricks you do use on stock charts. All right, but it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce our special guest today, John Murphy. Tom and I consistently tell our viewers, John, that how much we've learned from you, uh, really uh, the basics from you, as well as just some of those special uh, nuances to technical analysis. You've been a, a, a great mentor to us both. And again, great to have you here. It does look like an especially interesting market day. <laughs> uh, Aaron, first of all, thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, yes, we picked a good day to do this today. Uh, we all know the market is in uh, suffering some pain. But the point I want to try to make uh, is that, 
you know, we always look at, I always look at fundamentals and technicals. I think you really have to look at the two of them together. And I think we all know why the market's down. We know that one of the main reasons the market's down this week is because of the, uh, the trade situation. But I want to make the case that the, the, another reason for the sell-off has to do with technicals. Uh, in other words, the fact that the market was, was ready for a pullback. And that's really the whole point of this message. I'm just going to read the headline. Uh, this is the headline that was written yesterday. Uh, World stock indexes are testing overhead resistance and looking overextended. That may explain their bad reaction to trade tensions. So it's really a combination of some bad economic news at a time when the markets were vulnerable. And then just the world stocks have to clear resistance levels to resume their uptrend. Well, that, that's kind of obvious. But that first paragraph there, trade, sension, trade tensions rattle overextended global markets. Uh, um, we all know it all started with a tweet last Sunday night, and of course, Monday and Tuesday were, were especially negative days. But again, it's the combination of the two. And I want to say on balance, the, the global markets still look positive. We're going to look at four or five of the major markets around the world, and you're going to see essentially the same thing in all of them, that uh, they're all up against some kind of a resistance barrier while they're in a very overbought condition. They all have one thing in common. All of those markets are up against barriers and overbought. Now, let's start with the U.S., which obviously is the most important market, I think. We're going to use the same, same uh, chart format for all of them. This is a weekly chart. Now, this is, uh, this is through, uh, let's say, Wednesday, okay? And the whole point of this chart is just simply to give us a longer-term perspective. You know, the market's had a spectacular start to this year, but we are right up against the highs of last September. We went a little bit above it last week, but not meaningfully. And you can see that red bar. That is through, uh, let's say, through uh, maybe Wednesday morning. You can see the sell-off. So I think it's safe to say anytime the market has this kind of a rally, we're up like 25% in a short period of time. We're up against an old high. Every chart reader knows that that becomes a, if the market's going to stall or pull back, that's a normal place for it to happen. And if you go a little bit further up on the chart there, you can also see that the nine-week RSI overbought territory over 70. That's the first time we've been overbought since the uh, fourth quarter of last year, starting to weaken a little bit. Also, the uh, histogram bars, MACD, those green bars. Uh, I still use MAC, but I'm, I'm starting to switch over a little bit more to PPO. Uh, the PPO indicator, but I still use the histogram bars. They're still positive, which means we're above the zero line. But notice they're starting to weaken a little bit. That simply means that the uptrend is starting to, to weaken a little bit. So overbought market, a little loss of upside momentum, and we're up against resistance. This chart shows that uh, the S&P was testing its blue line. That's the 10-week uh, 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 or 50-day. We've actually broken below that. So it seems reasonable to assume that we will go down and test that red line, which is the uh, the 40 week or the 200 day moving average. So, so the fact that the market was in a vulnerable position is the reason why I think we're getting this negative reaction. But let's move down to the next chart, which is Canada. I'm going to stick with North America. The chart is very, very similar, remarkably similar. In fact, you can see this is the Toronto index and it's right up against again, the high that we, I think that was the September high. Same thing, pu pulling back a little bit. The last time I looked, it was also breaking below that blue line today. Uh, so that so the uh, the ten week or the fifty day moving average is being broken. And again, same thing. The market was overbought, starting to weaken a little bit. So when we look at both uh, the U.S. and Canada, we had a situation: markets up against major resistance, extremely overbought. And at at that particular point, we get some bad news, starting to pull back. Now, let's leave North America and let's move to some foreign markets. Now, one of the things you'll notice on all these foreign markets, they're not nearly as strong as the U.S. They have been rallying through the first quarter of the year, or the first four months of this year. Uh, they were all rallying in sync with us, but much weaker than us, than us. But none of them had reached the old highs. But even so, they have reached resistance barriers. Now, we're going to start with the DAX because the DAX is really – the key market in Europe, or the Eurozone at least. It's the biggest market in Europe. It's the most influential market. And by the way, uh, the uh, uh, Jap uh, German market is very closely linked to the Chinese market because 
uh, Germans, uh, uh, German economy is very export oriented and a big chunk of those exports go to China. But anyway, the point of this chart, these are weekly bars. If we just look at the bars uh, themselves, you can see that um, the DAX uh, rallied, has had a nice rally since the beginning of the year. But just simple chart analysis, I just simply drew a, a line along the highs of last year. And you can see the DAX went above its rally last week, but we're back below it. So I think it's safe to say that uh, it looks like the DAX right now is failing a test of that fallen trend line. The DAX is down over 1% again today. And bear in mind, that is the biggest economy in Europe and very closely linked to the Chinese market. So uh, it all makes it makes some sense here. But the point is something to make, a, make here, the same thing, overbought. Uh, uh, so you look at the indicators, we're seeing the same thing in all the markets. The point is simply that the DAX is up against resistance. Now let's keep going, we'll go to Asia. Uh, and first of all, look at the RSI right on the top. We're going to look at the Nikkei index. And you can see that the RSI going back, whatever that is, two years, we're right up against. We didn't quite reach overbought territory, but right up against a trend line. So that's usually a sign that the market is a little overextended. But if we look at the price bars themselves, again, remember, this is the, um, this is the Nikkei, the Japanese stock market. You can see uh, it had a big drop. Um, had a big drop uh, during the fourth quarter of last year, along with everything else. We've had a very strong rally during the first quarter of the first uh, four months of the year. But notice those last two uh, bars there. Now, this chart is through Tuesday, I believe it was. Uh, no, I'm sorry, through Wednesday. Um, so uh, you can see those last two bars there. Now, why, why we're up against resistance, what I did here, is you see those uh, horizontal lines there, those are Fibonacci retracement levels. For those of you who don't know what they are, uh, it has something to do with Elliott Wave Theory. But normally when markets uh, are, are um, retracing a portion of a previous trend, for example, in this case, we're retracing the downtrend, there are certain levels that become very significant. Uh, 61.8% normally is a significant barrier. Whenever a market retraces 62% of a previous trend, that often that often is a point where the market will stall or start to retrace. So um, it's, it's a significant resistance level and the Japanese market reached that uh, over the last week or two. I don't know if you can even see that last bar there, but a gap down is a little tick there. The market actually gapped down. The reason the, uh, <clears throat> the Nikkei gapped down so much is because on Tuesday, when most of the uh, other markets sold off, the Japanese market was closed for a holiday. So. Uh, I won't say it caught up, it caught down, actually. So it gapped lower, and the Japanese market is down sharply again today. So the point of this chart is just simply to show <clears throat> that even in Japan, although we're nowhere near the old highs, even the Japanese market had reached a, uh, a resistance level and is starting to weaken. And then we'll, uh, the last market we're going to look at is the Chinese market, uh, the, the Shanghai market, which is probably the most important one at the moment. And you can see sort of this chart isn't as convincing, but <clears throat> I did the best I could with it. This is the Shanghai market. And you can see how weak the Shanghai market was. These are weekly bars, by the way, um, since the beginning of 2000. In fact, last year, the Shanghai market was the weakest market in the world, okay? And uh, kind of weighed on everything else. And I think the weakness there eventually led to the big sell-off in US stocks at the end of last year. Now, since the beginning of this year, the Shanghai market has become was the strongest market in the world and actually led the global rally. It even read, it rose faster than the U.S. It was by far the strongest market in the world. We have to assume that a lot of that had to do with, uh, with the fact that um, there were, let's say, more optimistic feelings that the trade situation uh, was going to was going to be solved. We kept, they kept telling us that everything was going to be solved. They were close to a resolution. And... Uh, Anyway, it was the strongest market in the world. It went a little bit above the 62-point uh, line, but I measured it today. The actual recovery was two-thirds, which is another technical. I'm not actually making this up. This is actually true. Two-thirds. It actually rallied about two-thirds, which is another point. But the bottom line is it, it has weakened since then. You can see the uh, that last bar. Again, this chart is through Wednesday. The Shanghai market gapped down very badly. In fact, I believe it 
uh, I believe it is the weakest market in the world this week, uh, Shanghai market. I think on Tuesday it was down 5%. I think it's now down another 2% today, gap lower. So uh, you can see, though, it's clearly leading uh, leading the world lower, which shows how, how important the Chinese market is. But the, 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 really, the really important message that I want to make in all of these is that all of these markets were up against resistance barriers. They were all due for a pullback, and I think we're getting it. I finally want to wind up with just two indexes, two uh, world indexes, which um, I think are, are worth looking at. Um, the first one is the, um, the world indexes are also testing overhead resistance barriers. Uh, the first one is the um, the MSCI All Country World Index iShares. Now, this is a, a, we use this as an index for the global stock market. Okay, and you can see that uh, overbought they may see D lines weakening. So we see this everywhere. But if you look at the chart itself, you can see that we had um, a tremendous rally this year, right up against the highs of last September. Sort of what we're seeing in the U.S and starting to back off this week. In fact, I looked this morning, um, that blue line there is testing the blue line. Again, this chart's a, a day, two days old now, would actually fell below that line today. Now, the only problem with looking at this particular index, yes, it does give us an index, uh, a picture of the world, but it's a little misleading because the U.S. accounts for almost half of that. You know, it has a very heavy weighting and, um, it, uh, we, we really dominate, and we have been the strongest market in the world. So this index, even though a lot of us look at it, it really doesn't give us a true measure of what the world is doing. To do that, we have to go to our final chart, which is the one I really want to talk about, which is the MSCI All Country World Index XUS. This is what the rest of the world looks like without the U.S., okay? And it's an index that includes emerging markets, it includes foreign developed markets, it includes Canada, it includes everything outside of the U.S. And it paints a very different picture than the chart you just saw. First of all, you'll notice that, uh, just to, we'll just focus on the price bars, I think, for this one. You can see that this index actually peaked in the beginning of 2018. You may recall our market last September, our market also corrected at the beginning of last year. But you may recall last August, September, our market was hitting a record high. And I remember uh, writing articles at the time that this made no sense. How could our market be hitting record highs when the rest of the world was actually falling? It didn't make any sense. And I think that contributed to the huge pullback in our market in the fourth quarter of last year. But anyway, uh, this index bottomed right at the um, end of last year, along with us, and you'll see that it's rallied very nicely. So our market always does better when foreign markets are rallying with us. It is true that our market has done better uh, than, than the other markets, with the exception of China. But, but the fact that they're rising was good for us. And you'll notice that, that that blue line, black line that I have drawn in there, right around the 48 level, that is the 62%. We're coming back to that again the 62% retracement level. You, normally when a market rallies, when it gets to the 62% point, especially if it gets there too fast, it's usually vulnerable. And also you'll notice that that was the peak that was hit last September. So uh, even the foreign stocks hit resistance, got overbought, and they're due for a pullback. And of course, this index is down fairly sharply again today. It looks to me like with all these blue lines being broken, the 10 week moving average, it looks like we may have to we may have to uh, sweat out a retest of the red lines, which is the really the, the that's really the test of the major trend: the 40-week moving average, the 200-day moving average. <clears throat> With a lot of 50-week move, a 50-day moving average is being broken all over the world. I think there's a very strong chance that we will retest that red line, and that will be a bigger test. But the whole point here is just a kind of the confluence of technical and fundamental factors. If this news about this trade situation had come out a month or two ago, I'm not sure it would have made that much of a difference because the markets were rallying, we were getting good economic news, the Fed was, uh, was on hold. But the fact that all these markets together have rallied up into major overhead resistance, they're extremely overbought. Some of the indicators were already beginning to lose momentum. Simply meant to be, if the market was due for a pullback anyway, and then when we got the trade news, we're getting a very, very negative reaction. So it's sort of a confluence 
of uh, technical and fundamental factors. I have to believe that if, if this trade uh, situation is resolved at some point, these markets will rebound. But I do think before that happens, um, we will we will see more more to the. I still believe this is a correction in an ongoing uptrend, but I think we're gonna we're gonna have to retrace uh, some of these gains during the during the uh, during the, the uh, first part of this year before the markets are able to stabilize again. And uh, with that, uh, Tom and Aaron, I think I'll uh, turn it back to you and see where you want to go from here. All right, I have a question for you, John. And I think from these charts that you've shown, first of all, great uh, explanation. I agree with you. I think that many of these overhead resistance areas provided uh, reasons, technical reasons for selling. And then we get some fundamental news to kind of you know, piggyback on. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of selling. I want to go back to the Chinese market, though, for a minute um, and the Shanghai. And you can see that in 2018, and you and I were talking about this before the show, um, I think it was clear that markets around the globe were were saying that the U.S. was going to win out on this trade war. Uh, the, the steepness of this drop in China versus what we saw in the U.S. Um, and I, I subscribe to the buy on rumor, sell on news or buy or sell on rumor, buy on news kind of approach. And I think that's what happened here with China. I just want to get your thoughts on this. You know, when everyone was fearful and we were talking about the, the trade war, China got hit much harder than the U.S. And then when things just kind of subsided and we started strengthening and everyone started thinking, OK, and even uh, President Trump was tweeting off and on about, you know, we're getting closer and closer to a trade deal. The news seemed a lot more positive. And once we got to that point, that's when we saw China really beginning to outperform. Now, all of a sudden, there's a bunch of uncertainty again, and there's a war of words going back and forth between the two countries. And we're seeing this big drop once again, things a lot worse in China than they are here in the U.S. So my my question to you is that let's say we get this deal and I don't know if it's going to be this week, next week, a month from now or whatever. But do you believe that China has already been priced? You know, a lot of this this trade deal has already been priced in to China and that once we do get a deal, do you think China rebounds and outperforms the U.S.? I sure hope so. I don't know if they'll outperform us, but but what's interesting about that chart, Tom, first of all, just 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 applying simple chart analysis, you see that little double bottom there between October and December, mm -hmm. and then it, uh, it it rose above its 40 week moving average. But I but it's clearly the, the fact that the rebound, I, this obviously has to be tied to trade news. The fact that the Chinese market did so well uh, during the, the, the first four months of this year, I think really took a tremendous weight off the rest of the world. And and as I mentioned, it was a strong, it has been the strongest market so far this year up until this week. Now it's become the weakest market again. So clearly what happens in China affects what happens here. But also, I think what you're also asking is that it clearly, the charts clearly indicates that China has a lot more to lose than we do. I mean, um, as I mentioned, uh, we were hitting record highs during the fourth quarter of last year when China was plunging. So um, I hope that the, uh, the the Chinese negotiators know how to read charts, and um, uh, I hope they're looking at some of these charts because when they look at uh, on Tuesday, the Shanghai market plunged five percent. Now we were down one percent also. They're down five percent. Clearly, when the trade news gets bad, <clears throat> China gets hit a lot worse than we do. Clearly, we do suffer, and the rest of Germany suffers, and the rest of the world suffers. But China has the most, it, it, see, it, the charts seem to suggest that China has the most to lose from this. And I think from just listening to most experts, <clears throat> the feeling seems to be that it, it would be almost suicidal for both countries to have a serious prolonged trade. It would be suicidal for both countries. The fact that uh, it wouldn't be good for us, even though we, we wouldn't do as badly as China. It wouldn't be good for us. So the general feeling is sooner or later, uh, they're going to have to come to some kind of a resolution, and hopefully uh, that will help. I don't know that that has to happen to stabilize the markets. I think even just a statement that we're going to reopen talks or something like that, and we're optimistic, that might even be enough to stabilize the markets. But clearly, <clears throat> you can trade the U.S. market without looking at what's happening in China and what's happening in these other global markets. Okay. Um, so... I'm going to take it maybe in another direction. Let me uh, move over to um, tell you what I'm going to grab. 
I'm going to look at the S&P 500. I want to take a longer term view. I mean, we're we're going through 2018 and 2019, but let's pull up a longer term monthly chart. I know we've got a lot of folks that are much longer term that listen into the show from time to time. And I know a lot of your analysis, John, uh, is is many times focused a little bit more on that longer term. When you look at an S&P 500 chart, and this goes back just the last 15 years, but I can go back and you know, let's go back 30. Um, my argument um, and I'd love to get your take on this. My argument is that we're out of the secular bear market that we suffered through uh, for 10, 12 years here. And when we got that breakout in 2013 to take this double top out, I believe we entered a secular bull market. And so when you see these pullbacks and at pullback, I don't it, it almost seems too harsh to just call it a pullback from the fourth quarter of last year. But these, in my view, are more secular uh, this is a secular bull market, more cyclical bear markets in nature. Would you agree with that? Do you think that the long term remains uh, up here and that whatever happens in this you know, next couple months is a buying opportunity? Uh, well, yes, we have, certainly are in a secular bull market. There's no question. We were in a secular bear market between, what, 2000 and uh, 2008. Um, and we, we've been in a secular bull market for the last 10 years. The only thing that concerns me is that we are now the longest bull market in history. Uh, no bull market in history has ever lasted longer than 10 years. So that kind of worries me a little bit. And as it does turn out, we, you know, when we had that sharp downturn uh, late last year and a lot of us were calling it a bear market. But I think you're right. I remember reading you writing about this, that it was, it was a cyclical bear market, which is, means a shorter term bear market in a longer term secular bull market. But what does concern, Tom, can you just zoom in on this chart just a little bit, like just the last 10 years? What bothers me a little bit is that, um, I say it is the longest bull market in history, what bothers me a little bit. We are going through a retest of the old, the old high. Um, yes, the trend is still up, moving average trends are up, but if the market's gonna run into any serious problems, this is where it's going to do it. And by the way, that indicator on the top of the chart, I don't know if you meant for me to talk about this. That is, I believe, the PPO. Yes. Yeah, I know you like that indicator. <laughs> uh, I listened to your workshop earlier today about why you like it so much. But um, <laughs> you'll notice that is negative. You know, yeah. every, every pullback, I wouldn't even pull back, every downturn we've had in the last uh, 10 years, the, uh, the those lines they had one in 211. Well, first of all, 209, obviously. 211, it turned right back up. Uh, 216 to turn right back up. It's still negative. Yeah. And I keep looking at that and I say, well, it, it, it maybe it's just a leg. It is a lagging indicator. I understand that. Uh, I hope people see, know what we're looking at there, Tom. But um, this up there, it's still negative. So the fact that we're testing the old highs and we're, we're still negative, we are the oldest bull market in history. Um, yes, the trend is still up, but I'm still, <laughs> I'm a little cautious here, I'll have to admit. Yeah, and I, I also would uh, throw in there too, Aaron, and you can chime in, um, but I know Decision Point uses the PMO, which is fairly consistent with the PPO. It's not exactly the same, but I know the PMO on a monthly chart is still below that signal line and still, I think, uh, and I don't want to take the words out of Aaron's mouth, but there she goes. She's got the chart up there, yep. but that's a problem on the long-term weekly chart still. Am I correct? Not only that, not only that, Tom, but if you look at that indicator, <clears throat> notice that the... Uh, it, it is still below its 216 peak. Yep. Yes. So not only is it, this is very long-term stuff. Not only is it negative, but I, I remember we all pointed out at the end of last year when we, we, we well, I'll speak for myself, I started turning quite negative. Uh, this is one of the things I pointed out that for the first time in 10 years, uh, this long-term monthly indicator was not only turning negative, but it was giving a major negative divergence. Now, the market has recovered nicely, but I'm still a little concerned about that. I, I would feel a lot better if that line turned positive. It hasn't done it yet. So I'm still a little nervous about the fact that this is the longest bull market in history. Right. And I know I've been very bearish. Um, and some people might see this, you know, we have that little top under the signal line, but but guys, we're only about a week into the month, so I'm not really going to put a lot of emphasis on the fact that the monthly PMO turned down because we have a lot more trading to go and we could see it turn itself right back around by the end of the month. I'm not so, so sure we'll see that, um, but I've been writing a lot about these PMO sell signals on monthly charts. They just don't happen that often and and they usually do 
give us some warning on some some key problems, you know, even if it's more short term, like you can see back here. Yeah. And looking at that chart, Aaron, I would just say, too, if you look back to 88 through 92, mm -hmm. you know, the monthly PMO kept dropping, but mm -hmm. prices kept going up. I mean, once you've had a big move and you get that PMO or PPO or whatever momentum oscillator you're looking at, once it gets up pretty high, it's hard for that that to keep going up. It's not a price chart. It's a momentum chart. Sure, and it's an so, oscillator. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes price action moves up when you're when you're coming back down and you never really get a big move down. Sometimes you just get that consolidation. And so mm -hmm. maybe back to your point a little bit, John, I think a little consolidation here would not be a bad thing to bring that PPO down a little bit. I, I, I'm very bullish and I'm, I'm very bullish, not just in the short term, but I think the next five to seven years could be an extremely big move. I see a lot of things taking place very similar to what we had back in the late 90s. And we see what happened uh, back in the late 90s in terms of the S&P 500. We had a big run up to the upside. Um, I love the fact that the S&P 500 is outperforming and until until something else on a longer term basis can begin to outperform the S&P 500, I think this is an area we certainly want to make sure that we have a lot of exposure to. And Tom, it's interesting. Uh, just uh, I was noticing looking at that weekly chart, the market rose 19 weeks in a row since uh, New Year's Eve, uh, Christmas Eve, 19 weeks, not in a row, 19 weeks. Uh, 15 of those weeks were up. There were only four weeks where the market pulled back, and I think the biggest pullback was 2%. I mean, that's phenomenal. That's just incredible. And I know that uh, a lot of people who were looking to buy back in kept waiting for a dip, and they, we, we, they never got it. I still suspect this is just a little anecdotal, but uh, I think there were a lot of people waiting on the sidelines, hoping and praying for a pullback so they can and I think money managers as well, some that I know, are waiting for a pullback to put some money into this market. So uh, I agree with you, even though I'm somewhat nervous. Uh, I, I, the trend is clearly up. I think if we got, maybe we'll retrace a third of this uh, of this uh, correction, maybe maybe a third, 50% is probably a little too much. But I think if we can get a decent pullback here, work off these overbought conditions, have the market stabilize a little bit, uh, I think the market could be in a healthier technical position. Yeah, I would agree. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna change uh, um, I'm gonna change topics here, and I'm gonna focus now on the sectors. You know, we talked uh, very briefly about this before the show, but I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the one week performance. Let me just get an update, make sure that we've got the latest here. Um, but this is the last week, so this encompasses a lot of what we've been seeing to the downside. When you look at this, John, and, and take a look at what's been leading us to the downside, do you draw any conclusions? Yes, very definitely. These are all trade related. Uh, um, I'm surprised. Materials, for example, got hit very hard this week. Um, bear in mind that when we, the mainly materials are what's really leading it lower. I even look today, copper stocks, aluminum, steel, and copper stocks, chemical stocks to a certain extent. But really, if you look at where the weakness was this week, uh, aluminum, steel, and copper. Uh, uh, these are economically sensitive groups. Copper is very, very closely tied to China. China is the biggest importer of uh, copper. And I think I pointed out earlier in the week that copper, uh, the price of copper has really started to fall. Copper stocks are, are, are in decline. So I think this is very much, uh, very much tied. Oh, there you go. Right on cue. Uh, <laughs> it's almost like we rehearsed this, which we didn't. I'm listening. I'm listening. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Uh, so copper stocks are doing quite poorly. So I think that uh, I also noticed today the Australian dollar is, is very close to a, a low for the year. It's, it's the hardest hit currency over the last month. It's a little off the subject, but the Australian dollar is very close to the industrial metals, also very close, very close tied to China. So and then uh, so we had materials. Uh, which you just showed. The other one was, um, there you go, materials. Then the technology. Technology very closely tied to trade with China. Apple, for example. In fact, if you look at uh, the weakest markets in the, the Dow today, Intel and Apple are two of the weakest. Intel, of course, is semiconductor stock. Semiconductors are very, very closely tied to the trend in, in China. And of course, Apple also, all the Apple suppliers. So technology stocks are getting hit very hardly as well. 
uh, industrial stocks like, well, Boeing may be going down for other reasons, but uh, yeah, there you go, Tom. You're keeping up with me. Very good. Fine. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Uh, there you go. Industrials also very closely tied. Uh, Boeing, Caterpillar, uh, anything tied to global trade, uh, aerospace, and even some, by the way, in the industrial sector, uh, bear in mind, the industrial sector also includes transportation stocks and uh, delivery services. Some of the transportation stocks have started to weaken. So these are, um, so these are really technology, industrials, um, basic materials. These are all stocks tied to global trade. So it isn't a surprise to see that uh, they are leading the market lower. It all, it all ties together. It all makes sense. So if you were, you know, if you wanted to trade, but you didn't want all this volatility, I mean, obviously the volatility is applying mostly to the areas you just mentioned that are really tied to the trade. Would you try to stay away from uh, areas that maybe that were involved because there's so much uncertainty right now? Would you rather stick I mean, I was just looking, for instance, in the industrials, and I saw railroads. Of course, railroads, uh, as far as I know, don't ship across the ocean. Um, no, they they're don't. More, you know, North American kind of, uh, um, you, know, you know, stocks. So would you favor groups like railroads, for instance? That well, go, if, go, go back to that with that list you just showed, Tom. It's interesting. Uh, yes, a railroad very definitely because, uh, in fact, we've shown, I think you have, and I, I know we've both shown charts of railroad stocks over the last month or two, uh, hitting record highs. And they are very closely tied to the American economy because, you know, you have to ship the goods, the whatever it is, the the materials and the grains and all that. So I, the rails are certainly look very good, but heavy construction, you know, uh, not heavy construction. I was going to say home construction, you know, uh, uh, stocks tied to a home building, for example, have done extremely well. They're more in the consumer discretionary sector. They've done extremely well because of falling interest rates. But if you're looking to hide right now in the market, I think you sort of have to stick with some defensive stocks like consumer staples, at least for the time being, if, if you want to, if you want to do some rotating over the very short term, I think you have to stick with, um, you know, uh, staples or utilities or something like that. Uh, but I, I, I personally don't don't recommend a tremendous amount of rotating for short term stuff. You know, uh, well, this kind of leads into a question that we did have in the room. And the question was, would you hold on to, you know, healthcare and biotech stocks and ETFs at this point? Uh, hoping for better times. And of course, my first answer is never trade on hope. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd be very interested in your take. That's a good one. It, uh, healthcare stocks are very interesting. Uh, they were, uh, next to energy, they were the second weakest group of the year. Uh, and I believe they're back, they're below their 200 day moving average. Uh, and every time they start to bounce, they fall back again. The problem, people think of, um, uh, healthcare is being a safe, a safe sector. And it is true to a certain extent, if you think about pharmaceuticals and things like that, that biotech, in my view, is one of the riskiest parts of the market. And they really got hammered earlier in the week. Uh, there you go. Uh, right on cue. Thank you. <laughs> Aaron, did you do that? No, I have to give Tom credit. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I it is true that healthcare has traditionally been viewed as a defensive group, but right now they don't seem to be operating that way. And I think the main reason has to do with, with biotech stocks. So healthcare, uh, uh, I wouldn't consider that a defensive group. That's If I was looking to hide right now for a little bit, I'd probably go with consumer staples and utilities. They're very defensive. And also <clears throat> bond yields are down. As you know, bond yields have been falling the last week or so. Um, and um, normally when that happens, dividend paying stocks tend to do a little better. And you might also include REITs in, in that. So those are the places I would probably hide if I were looking to hide. You can see right now, energy is just, I don't know what to do with that. Healthcare, communications. I would say consumer staples, utilities, and maybe REITs. If you were looking to just hide, you know, with it just for the next few weeks or the next few months until we ride this thing out, that's probably where I'd be looking right now. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned uh, energy, and I, so I wanted to pull up a longer-term chart here. I'm going to go back and uh, let's do a monthly chart that goes back the last 20 years on the U.S. dollar. And then down below, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to bring up the relative strength of energy. This is a, a chart that I show here a lot on Market Watchers Live. 
Um, and then also, uh, and by the way, I, I always try to credit you because all of your intermarket relationships, um, it's, it has definitely changed the way I look at the market over the years. So I give you full credit for this. Um, but let's take a look at, um, pull this up first. And uh, let me make this a little bit bigger down here so you can uh, get a better view of it. Um, yeah, anytime I use the relative strength um, and comparing two different symbols, I like to use the a line chart as opposed to a candlestick chart. I just think it comes out a lot better. And just wanted to get your thoughts on this because the question comes up a lot. You know, energy and materials have been lagging for quite a while. And when I look at this chart, first of all, the last bull market that we had, 2003 to 2007, you can see the dollar was declining and energy and materials led the S&P 500. But I believe we're in a different environment now with, with this bull market being accompanied by a rising dollar. And I, I remember listening back, I don't know, in 2011 and 12, everybody was so used to the dollar going down that they just figured that's what would, that's what triggered the bull market. And it's like, well, not really. You can have a rising dollar in a bull market and a weak dollar. But the last eight years, the dollar, in my opinion, has been on a rise. And you can see the impact on the relative strength of both energy and materials. So one of the things I've talked about is really avoiding these two areas until we see some sort of deterioration in the dollar. Do you have any thoughts on the dollar and, and whether or not you do you consider this to still be in an uptrend or do you think we topped in 2017 and maybe starting a downtrend? Just wondering if you had any thoughts on the dollar. Yes. Uh, you obviously don't read my messages, Tom. Well, I do, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> setting, up, I'm setting up the I, questions for the I, audience. I wrote, man. You know, I, wrote a, I wrote a very interesting, I think it was interesting last week after the last Fed meeting when um, they, the chairman said that uh, the the fact that inflation was low, it was very, the, the, the downtrend in uh, inflation was transitory. And I felt compelled to put up a chart of commodity prices, which had been plunging for 10 years. Right. If you want to, if you want to, uh, you know, commodity prices are not the whole story, but uh, they are an important indicator of inflation. If you want to figure out what's going on in inflation, good place to start is look at commodity prices. They've been plunging over the last 10 years. That's not exactly transitory. And uh, and I also showed a chart of the dollar over that and showed that every time we've had an uptick in the dollar over the last 10 years, commodity prices have fallen. And as you point out, when commodity prices fall, that means that energy stocks, um, industrial metals, stock base metals, uh, material stocks, even gold to a certain extent, generally underperform. And that, that is exactly what we've seen. So uh, I tend to agree with you, as long as the dollar remains strong, uh, there are better places to be than, than, in, uh, than in stocks related to commodities. They're clearly in a downtrend. I wish the Fed would pay more attention to commodity prices um, when, when they're talking about inflation, because I remember reading that they say they're totally confused as to what's causing the inflation. All they have to do is look, look at a commodity chart. But I also made a, a point, Tom, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds with this, that um, why is the dollar so strong? Well, obviously the dollar is strong because we do have the strongest economy in the world. <clears throat> also, we have the highest interest rates in the world. You know, the Fed started uh, tightening a few years ago. The rest of the world is still in uh, Europe and Asia. Their yields are still negative. So we still have the highest interest rates in the world among developed markets. We still have the strongest economy. And as long as that's the case, uh, I think the dollar will remain strong. And if that's the case, I think uh, commodity stocks uh, will continue to underperform. Yeah, this is a chart. I, I don't know if you would uh, recognize it, but based on one of your market messages a while back, um, it really inspired me to go back and take a look at the treasury yield in the U.S. versus German's 10-year uh, treasury yield. And you can see that the bottom in, and this gets back to the point you were just making, the bottom in the U.S. Treasury yield minus Germany was back in 2011, and we have been on this steady move to the upside. And you can see the dollar, while it's not perfectly correlated, it certainly is impacted quite a bit, positively impacted to the upside with, as you said, Treasury yields moving higher in the U.S. versus Germany. And I always use German uh, markets, whether it's the stock market or the bond market, um, because I, I find that the German market is most 
uh, is, is the most positively correlated market with the U.S. Uh, in terms of both uh, the stock market and the bond market. But I think this makes your point uh, beautifully. And here's the correlation, which, you know, if you're, if you're not a fan or you don't really understand the relationship here, I think if you draw this correlation and look at the difference in our yields in the U.S. versus Germany's and then compare that to the direction of the dollar, you will see that we are positively correlated almost the entire time over the last 10 years. So do you have any other comments to add to this chart, John? Uh, only, only Tom, no, your chart is absolutely right. Uh, our rates are, even though our rates are low by historical standards, what's the 10 year, two and a half percent? Yeah, it's still, German yeah. yield is negative. I mean, so we're still a high yielding currency compared to them. But I also wanted to make the case that I think that I noticed that, you know, we all follow the direction of the 10 year yield. It's very, very important, and it's been falling for the last uh, several months. Part of that is because the Fed has stopped raising interest rates. But I think a mistake a lot of people make is they see our yields falling, and they assume that's a sign of weakness in the American economy, and I don't think that's the case. We're falling because we're being held down by Europe. Everywhere else in the world, rates are negative. Like, take, take Germany, for example. There's a very close correlation between the direction of German yields and our yield, even though we outperformed, there was still a correlation. So uh, the fact that the European yields are still negative and there's absolutely no sign of any of that changing, that acts as a weight on our treasury yield. And it's very hard for our yield to go up when their yield is going down. So so I think the, the fact that our yields are so weak is more a reflection of weakness in foreign markets than it is in, in the U.S. market. So. Um, I think it's it's wrong to misread that. Use that as an, an I think it's wrong to use that right now as an as an indicator of U.S. weakness. I think that's misreading it. Yeah. One other point here too. This is the ten year Treasury yield. You were just talking about the the move to the downside, and I can show you the uh, Treasury yields in Germany. And there's the move down over the last couple of years. So it's been falling a little bit longer. And obviously, it, well, in my opinion, it's you know because our economy. I think the the world views our economy much stronger than Germany right now and, and Europe in, uh, in general. Um, but a question that I have for you, and I, I, I was kind of perplexed for a while because I thought that the 10 year treasury yield would bottom in December and we would just start to move back up. And with the yield moving up, of course, that means money is rotating away from the bond market. And of course that money, if, if uh, our economy is improving, that money should find its way into the S&P 500. But instead what we've seen is the yield continue to drop. And I know the Treasury market was sending the Fed a message back at the end of last year, no more rate hikes. And the Fed kind of you know, went against that and said, oh, no, we're still raising. We still see positive you know, economy ahead, blah, blah, blah. And that was another thing, another factor, in my opinion, that caused us the selling in the fourth quarter of last year. And I think the bond market is sending another message to the Fed right now, which is inflation is not a problem deflation might be the bigger problem. And I think that gets back to your point about commodity prices and the fact that dollars been strengthening and commodity prices have been going down. I think the, the bond market is saying, Fed, you need to cut rates. What do you think about that argument? Uh, I don't know about cutting rates, Tom, but first of all, the decline in the, those yields in the fourth quarter of last year, that, that was purely a, a, a rotation when the stock market plunged, people did move into bonds and that pushed yields lower. But uh, the, we all understood that. What was surprising that you would have thought that when the stock market rallied so strongly this year, people would have sold bonds and pushed bond deals higher, and that didn't happen. And that was the surprise. I suspect it's just, I suspect that that had to do with the fact that uh, <clears throat> the Fed uh, announced in January <clears throat> that they weren't, weren't going to raise rates, they were going on hold. Uh, and I think that uh, that stopped. Uh, that stopped the upward tr uh, trajectory in bond yields. And also the fact that, uh, so we had a very unusual situation this year where bond, uh, stock prices were rising along with bond prices. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is a little unusual. It is a little unusual, uh, but I agree with you when it comes to the Fed. Uh, uh, I, I wish they would just look at a commodity chart. This isn't transitory. Uh, the fact that inflation remains low is normally a good good thing for bonds, and it normally weighs on bond yields. So I think that that is certainly part of the answer. And then, until we get a significant uptick in commodity prices, 
uh, I don't think we're going to see any serious inflation pressures. And this is the first uh, this is the first economic expansion that I've ever studied where we don't have inflation. Every late economic expansion that I've studied, <clears throat> as you know, I've written books on this since World War II. We've always gotten a burst of inflation. That's always caused the Fed to tighten, and that has ended every economic expansion in every bull market. This time, we just don't have that. And we don't, no one totally understands why, and we're not quite sure what to do with it. Uh, you, you would think that this would, this, the fact that the Fed doesn't have to raise rates should uh, continue this economic expansion. But one thing that does haunt me is what happens if commodity prices really start to drop uh, and we do tip into deflation? What are the central bank is going to do? They can't lower interest rates because they're already, they're already too low. What are they going to do in Europe when they're already zero interest rates? In, in Japan, they can't lower interest rates anymore. So they can't fight deflation. And that's something that worries me. And by the way, if we ever go into the next another recession, what are they going to do then? Yeah. The Fed interest rates are, are so low here. How are they going to lower interest rates to combat the next inflation, uh, the next uh, recession? And those are things that worry me. Mm hmm. All right. Well, if you're, you know, we've talked a lot about the the big picture and you know what's been going on. But if you were somebody sitting on the sidelines right now and you've been waiting on this pullback and we're now starting to get it, uh, what would John Murphy's strategy be? I mean, would you be thinking about beginning to maybe j jump in a little bit with this pullback and if it keeps going down, continue to buy, or would you wait and try to find a discernible bottom in the market? How do you approach the market here? Well, I think for those people who are uh, look, who, who have missed a big part of that rally, uh, I'm not sure I'd be jumping in right here, but I do think that it is time to start start planning. Um, maybe if we go back, if we go back and tested that 200-day moving average, something like that. But I do think yes, I think that this will this will present a buying opportunity, uh, whether whether it should start today or next week. Or the problem is if you wait for this thing to be resolved, it may be too late because if they ever come out and announce that uh, they, they solved the situation, the market will be up 5% the next day. So I do think that this, this dip, and it may be a little early, maybe a little too early, but I do think this dip over the next, uh, I think the second quarter will be very volatile, and I think it will give, uh, give those investors who missed out uh, in the first quarter uh, an opportunity to do some bargain hunting. Yeah. All right. Uh, I did pull up a longer, well, three-year chart here on the S&P 500. And you can see that since this buying uh, began and, and we really started to take off back January and February, this is the first time we've actually gotten down even to test that 50-day moving average. And we have reversed quite a bit off the bottom from earlier now, you know, the volatility. And that would be a whole different discussion that we could talk about for quite a while, John. But the volatility index, you know, when it when it moves up and it gets up into the 20s, you look at the market one hour and it looks really bad. The next hour, it looks like you're reversing. And then two hours later, you're back at the lows. So it's really hard uh, from an emotional perspective to uh, to try to figure out exactly what the market's going to do for the next couple hours. I think 20 to me, uh, I know you, I think I read you use 18 as your, your threshold, but I use, I always use 20. In other words, when you look back, anytime we've had a, a sustained move above 20, I don't know where we were a little above it earlier today. I don't know where we are now, but, um, if, 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 if you get a sustained move, of, oh, there you go, right on cue. We're sitting right on 20, which is just a little bit above it. Um, if you get a sustained move above 20, say a weekly close. I, I like weekly charts. Like what day is today? Thursday. If we got a Friday close above 20, um, that, that, would, that would signal to me that uh, we're going into a period of higher volatility, which may, doesn't mean a, a big correction. It, it just may mean that we're going to pull back a little bit, maybe even move sideways for a while. You know, a, a period of consolidation would be preferable, obviously. But I think we're due for a period of volatility. I think it's a good thing, maybe not over the short run, because I think that um, against a lot of money, I think sitting on the sideline waiting to get back into this market. And I think um, a little period of volatility here might be a good thing. Yeah. And, it, you know, I just kind of drew a couple lines on the chart. I drew one at 18. I drew another one at 20. And you can see, I mean, it's not going to turn right on a dime. But, you know, we've had plenty of times where over the last five years, we have moved back up close to 18, maybe up to 20, maybe even a little bit above 20. Right. And I don't have the S&P 500 on this chart, but I could 
probably pretty much guarantee you that each time we've had these volatility spikes up into this area, with the exceptions of the big selling that we saw in 2015, 2016, and again, the selling we saw earlier in 2018, and then, of course, fourth quarter, those were a little bit more extensive. But many times we'll get a spike like this, right. and all of a sudden it just kind of subsides, the volatility goes back down, the market moves back to the upside. I suspect that that's probably what we're seeing now, but where exactly the market goes in the meantime is, is really hard to say. I think, I think it's probably a good time just to stand back and watch it, Tom, if it, you know, just to watch it a little bit here. I wouldn't get too aggressive. In either. I, I'm sure some short-term traders are taking profits. I think it's just a good time to watch it for a little bit and, um, you know, pick your spots a little bit and, see how we can ride this. Hopefully the charts will prove, prove you know, uh, offer some kind of a guide as to, uh, you know, when this thing has run its course and, uh, and uh, work off some of this overbought condition. But I, I do think I kind of agree with you that I think that uh, any pullback here, hopefully I would prefer a period of consolidation for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. uh, I, hopefully that will provide, I think it will provide some better buying opportunities. Yeah. One, one final point on the VIX. If you're looking at the chart, a lot of times, <laughs> You will see on these weekly charts, you see a long tail to the upside, meaning intra-week, the VIX was much higher and then came back down and closed much lower. Most of these tops have that kind of a look to it. And right now, you know, we're coming off of the earlier high. I would just simply say if the next, you know, if by tomorrow at the close, the VIX is back down to about 16 or 17 and the market has taken back off again, that probably, in my opinion, is marking an important short to intermediate term low in the S&P 500, but we'll see. Never know for sure, right? Tom, if I'm looking at that right, we're back below 20 again. Am I looking at that right? Yeah, just barely. Yes. So, so I, I, I've, I've always found 20 to be a very useful number. Maybe it's just a psychological number, but uh, you know, if we got a decisive close, a decisive close above that, especially on a Friday, I think that's what it would take to really uh, give me a signal of more volatility. But 20 is the key level, and we're just, we're just testing that right now. Got it. Well, I tell you, John, it has been a pleasure. We have waited way too long to get you on this show for a discussion like this. So will you please come back and join us soon? I'll try to. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for doing the charts uh, for me, Tom, and following along. And uh, thank you, Erin. Uh, thank you very much for contributing. And we all had a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't call it fun, but it was interesting. <laughs> it was actually a good week for you to come on because I know, you know, with all the nervousness in the market and the trade deal and all the foreign markets and the intermarket relationships, it was absolutely a perfect time to have you on. So I really appreciate you stopping by. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. All right. There he goes. Yeah, I cannot tell you how much I have learned from John over the years. Uh, if you haven't read John's book, uh, especially Technical Analysis of Financial Markets, that to me is my market, my inner market Bible, uh, mm -hmm. so much information in that book and, and, and his other books as, as well. Yes. Calling him a tech Titan is actually an understatement. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that. All right. Uh, well, let's, shall we jump into the 10 and 10 quickly? Oh yes. Here we go. There is your RG, the interesting one. I think people want to look at software companies, <laughs> kind of a lot there. So I know we'll be looking at a few of those. This is the daily RRG. You can see a lot of them moving in that northeast direction. So it should be interesting 10 and 10. But let's go ahead and start with uh, Team Atlassian. Okay. Uh, first of all, I love the chart here. I mean, you're talking about a stock that is breaking out to a new high, heavy volume, and in a market like we've had the past couple of days, this is not acting like many of the technology stocks. When we were just looking at some of the sectors that have been really impacted to the downside, software, not nearly as much as computer hardware or semiconductors, but still some of the software stocks have been down this week at Lacey and not one of them. A uh, big breakout here. I love the fact that uh, it's outperforming so, so well on a relative basis. I think it held up nicely off of an uptrend sideways consolidating. And now we're getting this breakout on good volume. Uh, gotta love this chart. Uh, I'm a I'm a fan. Uh, this is a stock I would certainly be interested in on a pullback. All right, the most popular. We actually have a tie, um, but it looks like TTD Trade Desk. I know you talked about that a little bit at uh, the beginning of the show. Let's look at the chart. Yeah, the market's reversing, and so is Trade Desk. And I actually looked at this one earlier, and I think that down into this area, 
is, and I was looking at it before the market even opened, um, but I was looking on any selling down into this area. I think that would be a great level. We did get to 180 and the stock is already back to 198. Uh, this has been one of the best performers in that software space. And of course, software has been leading the market. So I think TTD continues, even with the huge volume and the red candle, I think as long as it holds this area of support, I think stock goes higher. So I'm a fan. All righty. Next one up, uh, NVCR. And I think that was in the software area. Um, well, I'll pull it up on the relative. Oh, part. healthcare, medical, medical equipment. equipment. Yeah, medical equipment, NovaCure. Um, well, I do like the fact that this broke a nice uh, wedge. And so when I'm looking here, and this was a, a stock that was performing pretty well prior to starting this wedge. So what I'm looking at, first of all, you got an uptrend. And if you take these lines like this and like that, you see that piece of pie squeezing? We actually broke out. I didn't see the volume there. So you know, maybe even adjust this line and say, okay, well, there's the pie. Because here, you're getting the volume, I think, to, uh, to um, confirm this breakout. But I look for this stock because it did show some really nice relative strength. And it looks like it's broken that wedge also in its relative downtrend. I think this one's going higher. So I, I would look for uh, Novacure to maybe make a move back up to that 56, 57 level to test those earlier highs. All righty, next one up is going to be Vray, V R A Y. This was a blast from the past. <laughs> I used to own this one a long time ago. Okay, it doesn't have the relative charts up here. Um, so let me just look at it on a regular chart. But I do want to pull up that year because I think that shows quite a bit here. And then we'll annotate that. Uh, I think we've got some gap resistance and recent price highs that we're going to have to negotiate. So I'm not ready to jump right in here. But if you take a look at this gap and you look at the heavy volume, look where we failed. Right up at that 8.75, 880 area. And then right back down again. Now with volume, we're back up above the 20. I would be using the uh, rising 20-day moving average now as your key support. I think on this kind of a move uh, or that kind of volume, and breaking this downtrend, getting back up above the 20 and the 20 rising, PPO back in uh, positive territory. I would look for 880 to the upside, downside right now, down around 760, that 20 day. Let's see which way breaks first. I think this is gonna break out to the upside though. All right, let's see. Next one up is uh, Nectar Biotech, NKTR. Yeah, I thought uh, John made some great points about the biotechs. I agree with him totally. That's one of the most aggressive areas of the market. And even though it's in healthcare and you think healthcare is more defensive, you really have to strip out biotechs if you're going to be looking at defensive. To me, defensive maybe is the pharmas. Um, but the biotechs, I just want to see a breakout in the group. Otherwise, you're going to be swimming against the current. Um, we did have a nice reversing candle going in on the biotech industry in uh general, the DJ USBK. So that's something to keep in mind. But we have this downtrend that I would continue to watch. I think we've provided some really good support, but that is a descending triangle in a downtrending stock, which normally breaks to the downside. But I believe we're in a secular bull market. So I would watch this trend line. I think also getting through that 37 level would take out this most recent high. So I think 37, 37 and a half is an area I'd watch pretty closely here. All righty, let's see. Next one up in the Staples area, Pilgrim's Pride, PPC. All right, PPC. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a defensive stock. You wouldn't know it by the move to the upside here. This has been a really nice move from 15 to 29 in this year. So it's almost doubled, uh, which is pretty impressive for a stock in this area. And if you pull up the relative chart, you will see that it has been a tremendous relative performer. So I love the stock, but it is got, it's, a, it's way ahead of itself, I think, very overbought. So I would be looking for maybe at least a test of that uh, rising 20-day moving average. So I think it's a good looking stock, but you did have the gap down and the recovery right there at about just over 26 right here. And then you've got the 20-day right there. Good solid volume trends and a leader. 
So I think it's a good stock. I would just like to see a little bit more weakness, maybe try to get in closer to that 26 and a quarter area. All right. Let's see. Next one up is a software company, Workday, W-Day. All right. Uh, Workday, another great performer. Um, I think I see an uptrend here. This is a stock that outperformed big time heading into early 28, or excuse me, 2019. I think just a little bit of uh, uh, sideways consolidation on a relative basis. Last two and a half months, pretty much just going along for the ride with the group. But this overall has been a pretty darn good stock. So I would annotate and I'd be looking for a breakout here uh, in time. I think the key level to watch is the one that we tested on heavy volume in early March. I think the fact that we were able to break above that high right there at about the 200 level and pull back. And now we're reversing back up above the 20. I find all of this to be very bullish and constructive. So I'm a fan. I think it breaks out in time and I would be a buyer. I think anything back down close to the day's low, that 50 day moving average, I'd be a buyer. All righty. Next one in the financial space, Berkshire Hathaway, BRK slash B. I think it's a pretty ugly chart. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pulling back, but I really like that hammer on the 50 day moving average. So from 219 back to where it is now at 208, you got $11 upside. I think you keep a fairly tight stop. Um, it ha is pulling back into a gap support zone and also close to where it had broken out from previously. So I actually could uh, could make an argument here. There, there's the two key highs that I see in 2019. We broke out above that. There's also a gap. I could even draw another level right there at that gap. Uh, but I don't want to cloud the issue here too much. But I like this reverse on hammer um, off of this move to the downside and holding the 50 days. So I'd actually be on the bullish side of this one. Although if it loses today's intraday low, I would agree and, and turn more bearish on it. All righty, let's see. Kratos Defense, K-T-O-S. Yeah, this is one area at one point I meant to ask John about. Yeah, you know, I had mm -hmm. so many thoughts, so many questions, uh, but I really like the defense group. And I think Kratos is another one that recently broke a trend line and the overall group is strengthening. Here's the defense group relative to the S&P 500. It's getting very close to a multi-month relative high. Um, and a breakout there, I think, would really lead to some additional uh, uh, relative strength in the defense stocks. So I, I like the stock because you can see the stock relative to defense. While the group is going up, you can see this is actually going up faster than the group. So you got a really good one here. Uh, we are up against resistance. So let's kind of watch at that uh, resistance level. Maybe we'll get a pullback from there. But I think if we were to get back down to the uh, top of this gap support right here, big volume gap up and it's continued to go higher. I think if we were to get back 16 and a half, I'd be a buyer there. All right. Excellent. And our final one uh, was actually a downgrade today. JW Nordstrom, JWN. All right. Uh, JWN uh, Nordstrom. Yeah, it's been downtrending here for the last six months. The overall group apparel retailers have been going up. So there's really only one thing I need to look at this chart on it. And I'm just going to annotate one line. Anybody who's watched this in the relative ratios that I like to follow here. JWN Nordstrom's versus the apparel retailers. I don't know that there's one that's much worse out there right now than this stock. So I have, I'm not a bottom fisher. I'm not a value investor. I'm a momentum trader. And if I'm looking for momentum to the upside and I'm trying to outperform the S&P 500, um, it's not very easy to do it if you own Nordstrom's. So for that reason alone, I would pass on it. All right. Let's see. That does complete the 10 and 10. Here are all those symbols that we just went over. I will have these up in the Market Watchers Live recap and in our live chart list. Just go to the Articles tab, click on the Market Watchers Live blog, and the link to that chart list is right there at the top. Okay, it's time for talking technically. We've talked a lot about on the program the dollar and where it might be going and currencies. And with the trade war tensions we just were talking about with John Murphy, I think today's talking technically segment is especially timely. So let's watch this episode where Julius de Kempenar demonstrates how to create RRGs for currencies. <music> You can 
also use RRG on stockcharts.com to show currency rotation. Currencies are a different animal because actually currencies are always a relative. It's the euro against the US dollar. It's the US dollar against the Japanese yen. And for that reason, you gotta be a little bit careful. We have set up a predefined group on stock charts. Just go to the group selection box and scroll all the way down where you'll find two lines for currencies. The first one is FX US dollar base and the second one is FX euro base. Let's work on the US dollar base. If we load that one up, it'll show you the G10 currencies. And if you look properly at the various ticker symbols, you will see that the US dollar is always the second in line. So it's the Aussie against the US, it's Canadian against the US, etc., etc. This makes the US dollar the benchmark for this RRG. Now, because these are already relatives, we don't need a separate benchmark. And for that, we have to use a special ticker symbol. It's called dollar one. And as you can see on the chart on the right hand side, that doesn't change, which means that it will leave all our relatives intact. Currencies are usually best looked at on a daily time frame. So if we change that to a daily time frame and then hit update, we will get a proper chart that shows you the rotation of the various currencies around the US dollar. So for this chart, you will see various currency pairs. There's the Swedish Corona here, there's the British pound here, and they are all measured against the US dollar, which is in this case the center of the chart. All right, before I get into the final market update, I did want to mention that we are running a spring special and you really have to act quickly on it because it does end May 13th. If you go ahead and renew for 12 months, you will get two free months. So go ahead and check it out, just uh, stockcharts.com special and you should be able to get to this page and learn more about it. But let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the markets and what has been going on. All right, definitely interesting uh, 20, I think I have 30 minute bar charts on right now or 10 minute bar charts. And I think that it's really interesting to see while we were talking to John Murphy, we did see the market start to bottom and we have made up quite a few of the losses that we saw earlier. The Dow is down still a little over 183 points, which is about 2.72%. So we're still looking at some uh, very difficult uh, losses today, but making a comeback. We'll have to see if we can get up there higher. S&P is down a half a percent right now. NASDAQ, again, making these recoveries. It is down a little over a half a percent as well. New York Stock Exchange down just under a half a percent. Russell 2000 also making its move back and actually performing a little bit better than most of the markets right now. It is down 0.35%, but right now the TSX seems to be the winner. It is down just on, uh, about a quarter of a percent. Treasury yields are down today. 2.46% is what we're looking at right now. The VIX, you know, we had that spike, but we are coming back down below 20. And UUP, definitely a difficult morning, but has been steadily making up those losses. Gold had a nice spike to the upside this morning, but it is starting to pull back. GLD is still up 30 cents at 121.21. USO is making a, a comeback after very serious losses as well, but as you can see, it's still down almost a half a percent right now at $12.83. TLT had been spending most of the day in positive territory, took a little dip down below, but currently it is up 18 cents at 124.59. As far as our sectors go, here are the lists right now. Real estate is the leader with utilities, the only two in the positive territory. Technology and materials really taking it on the chin today uh, with technology down three quarters of a percent. All right, I will pass it back to you. All right, uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out a couple things here. Um, volatility, when we get into a volatile market like this, sometimes I spend more time looking at the VIX than I do at the actual charts. Um, if you go back and you look at some of the tops, you'll see these reversing VIX candles. You see that red one back on uh, January 23rd after we started to spike. You can see that false breakout reversal close near the low. Look at what happened 
on the VIX spike. We'd gone up four days in a row, got up over 18, reversed, came back down at 16. That marked the top. Here we gapped up. We were in a rise. We gapped up. Nice red candle. And then we start moving back down. I say all that because I want to see how this VIX closes today. If we continue to rally and, uh, and strengthen and you see the VIX continue to drop and print a bearish engulfing candle, something like that, that would suggest to me that probably not guaranteed, nothing's a guarantee, but probably the market has peaked in terms of nervousness. And I would then look for today's low in the market in terms of the S&P 500 being a very, very important low to watch as we go forward. Um, but that that remains to be seen. I have to see how we, we go the rest of the day. Currently on the chart, we've got a nice looking potential hammer that is right at the 50 day and right at the breakout we saw in early April above 2850. So this is one of the levels that I was watching to see if maybe we get a reversal from something to keep an eye on. And then finally, on an hourly chart on the S&P 500, we want to watch this downtrend. And the last low that we saw earlier today, much lower than a couple of days ago, much lower hourly PPO as well. So my guess is until I'm proven wrong, we're going to struggle to get back through gap resistance trend line and that 20 hour EMA. We failed yesterday at the 20 hour EMA. I, until we can break back up above it, I think we have to honor and respect what we see on this chart. So there's a lot of stuff we still have to pay attention to. I know the market crazy when we get this kind of volatility and nervousness. He swings back and forth. 300 points on the Dow is nothing. Let's see where we close today. And with that, we are going to move into our final segment, which is uh, some stock charts, tips and tricks. Aaron, what do you have? All right. I have a few here that uh, I think some of them our regular viewers are familiar with, but maybe a few of them you are not. So I'm going to actually go ahead and take the poll because we're going to be talking about what's on there. Uh, but I'm going to start off just with the, the ones I use uh, pretty regularly. Uh, and that would be my chart styles. Now I have on the decision point live chart list, which you can get to if you go to the articles tab, decision point blog, you can get all of these charts. Uh, but one of the things, you know, I like to switch between the daily and the weekly and the monthly, you know, more quickly. Uh, let's go ahead and I'll pull up just a random chart here. So this is my daily. I prefer, uh, actually, from your comments and questions uh, from the survey, I went ahead and added the full quote. Uh, you can do that very easily down here, just a click, quick check. And the Zoom thumb, thumbnail, which I always include on my charts as well, it's just a button click, so not a hard thing. But what you'll notice is, of course, everybody seems to have their own uh, chart styles, what they like to do. And there's a couple of ways you can get, get these chart style, styles and save them. This is the row that talks about the chart styles right here. And you can obviously you can make all kinds of different ones. But if you go down to the bottom, we have some predefined uh, chart styles. So if you like in particular, for example, we just had John Murphy on here. And I do think this is the default. Uh, there you can get his chart style, uh, Tom's chart style. Do they have you on sunset still? They do. <laughs> that was your old chart style, but I know you still use this now and then. Uh, so anyway, that's where you can get to our chart styles pretty quickly if you want to just add those to your chart. So, you know, the typical, um, you know, EMAs and such are on mine. But once you get a chart style, you might want to get to it a little more quickly than having to scroll through this list. And so what you can do is you can see on this uh, side here, you can go ahead and set your default, what you want as your default chart style. So you'll just set up whatever you want. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to mess up my default right now. Uh, but you can save it as a default. Uh, you can add new. That's how you would add your chart style names. But notice under here, we have button number. And so if you choose, you can have nine buttons. And I'll just throw one in here. And we'll just call it new chart style. The buttons are over here. And so you can quickly, once you have set them, just quickly punch through them. So I, there's my default. Uh, here is a market watcher's default. And now there's that new chart style I made as a default, and it's just in the button. If you just want to organize the buttons, uh, you can just click here, and now you've got uh, 
the ability to, you know, delete them, uh, move them around if you want one higher than the other, that sort of thing. Uh, and if you want to change and add a different one in here, uh, so let's say I want to add the candle glance one up in that menu, I can do that. I messed that up so you can't see it. Okay, so there you go. You can just drag it up here and, and that put that in there. I'm going to just move that one back down. And now I have those buttons exactly like I need them and want them. And since we're on the candle glance right now, uh, I'm sure some of you have noticed, uh, for example, let me just show you this. You've noticed that my candle glance is a little bit different on, um, on the, the market updates versus what I use on uh, the candle glances for, you know, when I do my uh, chart reviews for you. And so the way you can do this, and I, there's actually another little trick here. You can set it up the way you want, of course, for your candle glance. And that means that when you have a list like this, you can go in and say candle glance, and it'll be in that style for you. But what I've found uh, as well that I, I run into some of the time is that I want to use a couple different candle glances. So I've actually saved, uh, you know, a primary one, uh, my candle glance. This is a second secondary one that I'll use, uh, you know, things like that. I, I can just quickly uh, replace my the one that I have like that. And now that's going to be my candle glance from here on out. And then if I want to go back to my normal one, I can just go back here to my primary and then I just go ahead and replace with candle glance. So you could certainly do that for many different candle glances. So hopefully that was helpful. Uh, let's see, just real quick. Uh, one of the ones I, that I wanted to show you was how to, um, so we looked at the candle glance and the chart styles. I want to show you a few little uh, tips and tricks that we get questions out uh, about all the time. Number one is that you'll look at a chart in a blog and you just love it and you want to know how to save it or you want to know how to put certain um, individual indicators on them. Uh, so all you have to do is click it and then click the live version. And once you have it up here, if you go in and, and click the annotate button, just do a little bit of something so that it'll save it for you. Now you can choose where you want to save it. So I can put this in, for example, my upgrades and downgrades. And now I have it in that chart list exactly the way I want. Plus, I can come down here and see the different indicators and how those are set up. So I know I get a lot of it, for example, from my sentiment charts. People are interested, well, how do I get that chart? Uh, one way is to get it through the blogs. Another way um, is when you see those charts uh, in my blogs, click on them, and then you can come down here and then you can find the different things. Other quick little thing before I move it to Dom, that little minus that goes before my parameters, that's how I quickly invert my charts and my scales. So I always talk about how I've inverted scales. That's a quick and dirty way to do it is just add a, a minus sign in front of the parameter uh, symbol. All right, Tom, I think I've covered plenty. I'm going to let you take it over. All right, I'm going to, go, going to take a look at a couple of things here as well. First, I want to show you an invisible chart. So here on the S&P 500, this is just the normal charts, five years going back and just showing the activity. Uh, and you can see the moving averages here um, as an overlay. But if I use the invisible chart, all of a sudden, all of that noise, all the data is gone, and the only thing left are the moving averages. And you find the invisible under the type of chart. So here you've got candlesticks, line charts, whatever you want to use, histograms, Renko charts. Well, invisible is one of those options. And by displaying this on at, in an invisible chart, you only get your overlays. Now, you might look at the market from a longer-term perspective, and you might say, hey, as long as the this moving average is above that moving average. I'm going to stick with my positions. And this can kind of tell you without looking at anything going on in the S&P 500 as to whether or not you might want to get in, get out, or whatever. It just filters out the noise. So I like it uh, a couple of different times. Sometimes I use it with the volatility index. I've got an example here for you. 
using it with the equity only put call ratio because this is a sentiment indicator. It tells us when the market's getting too fearful or you know maybe too greedy. And so key bottoms you can mark. I mean, if you look at the, the major spikes, this is a daily chart. So you're only seeing one major spike, but some of them do line up with some pretty important bottoms. But this thing looks like an EKG. It's like, I, I have no idea what's going on here. Well, if you use, and, and by the way, there's my 20 day and my 50 day moving average in the middle. I mean, this just tells me nothing really. So if I use the invisible chart though, and set my moving average to five days, I see a chart that looks something like this. And now take a look at these spikes. Uh, when I get these major spikes and look down to where these major spikes are occurring on the five day moving average, every one of them almost lines up beautifully with these uh, major bottoms in the S&P 500. So this is a great way to use an invisible chart and then smooth it out. And you can custom this. So this is a five day moving average. Maybe you want to use a three day, maybe a 10 day, but you can go back and experiment. I think this is a really cool tool that uh, I don't see too many folks using on stock charts. And I think it's really powerful. Um, gives you an opportunity to really experiment with some things. Uh, and again, all you have to do is go down, set the invisible. And then under the simple moving average, I just put five in. So my chart becomes invisible. All of that data that I showed you over here all goes away. And the moving averages, everything goes away. I just put in that one five-day moving average, and that's all that shows up here. So it really smooths it. And, you know, you might go back and say, well, you know, I, I want a 20-day. And take a look at it there. And, you know, maybe that's something that's important. But you can kind of play around with it. The only other thing I wanted to talk about here is I'm going to pull up a chart of Caterpillar. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of questions about, you know, why we don't talk about dividends and so forth. Well, a couple of things. You can pull up the full quote. And if you pull up the full quote, you can see over here your yield, your annual dividend and yield shows up here. But then also under your indicators, if you go down to dividends, and I'm going to go back uh, and go back. Uh, let's just uh, show this over the last 10 years for Caterpillar daily chart and update it with the dividends on the bottom. This tells you when the dividends changed and you can see all the dividends have done on Caterpillar for the last 10 years is go up. This is the percentage um, paid each, each quarter. And you can see for a few years it stayed the same and then they had a raise, just a great way to go back and take a look. So let's go ahead and summarize these couple of things that Aaron and I just talked about. And also want to uh, take a look at that poll so that we can see what um, uh, what you all are familiar with, whether or not you're familiar with some of these things that we talked about right before we wrap up today's show. Yes. So there you go. Not surprising. Actually, I'm surprised about the candle glance because I used to get questions about that all the time. But I think our viewers are pretty savvy about it now. Yeah, I'm surprised that uh, dividend indicator is only 33%. I would think that a lot of folks do use that dividend indicator. And I'm actually surprised that invisible charts is higher than mm -hmm. the dividend indicator, but I'm glad that there are folks out there using it. Great tool. Yeah, invisible charts. Yeah, absolutely great for moving average uh, analysis. I absolutely agree. Great, uh, great trick and tip there. Yeah, and there's some things that are just really volatile. Equity only put call ratio goes up, then it goes down, goes up, down. VIX the same way, you know, not really a trend, not a long-term trend. They just spike and then come back down. Sometimes you might want to smooth that out. And I think using the invisible charts is a great way to do that. All right, well, we're at the end of another show. I got to say, this is one of my favorite ones. It was great having John Murphy on. I really hope we can get him back soon. I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, nice. Here is your upcoming schedule. Uh, you can check that out. Aaron's got a workshop coming up on Tuesday. I'm sure that she will be excited to provide you with something there. I do want to thank all of you for being with us today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit, especially today. What do you think of John Murphy's presentation? Was it awesome or what? Mm -hmm. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Thursday afternoon, everybody. See you tomorrow. Happy trading. Mm -hmm.